I assume there are some questions you'd like to have discussion. So, George, would you just take one of those pews? And Sonia, would you come up there? And Anthony, Owen, Gwen, and Peter Turchin already has a question. Okay, questions for Sonia. You mentioned um, uh, throughout an idea, Could happiness we? of individuals versus happiness of societies. So do you think really that happy societies uh, would be more, um, let's see, uh, effective in some way or another? Well, my very non-professional and just uh, uh, shallow um, knowledge of uh, such uh, society-wide um, surveys suggests that uh, fairly dysfunctional societies, uh, people uh, rather living in fairly dysfunctional societies report, could report very high levels of personal happiness. So what, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, um, well, I'm, not, I'm really not an expert on societies. Um, I, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that the, f the factors that make individuals happy are not always the same as the factors that make societies happy. So that's, that's something we could commit the ecological fallacy by doing that. Um, but um, um, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I do think that, I mean, there's lots of evidence that shows that happier people have these characteristics that are very functional, very adaptive, that are related to health. And um, so I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the definition of, um, of happiness that you're using. Um, but certainly what I have seen, and, and, and people who have, um, the nations that have the happiest uh, citizens um, usually are characterized by equal rights and democracy and, and good things like that. So, um, I mean, my reading of the evidence is that, that there is a, a, a positive relationship even with societies, but that's not my area of expertise. So, I mean, Peter, have you studied any of this? I mean, there have been lots of surveys recently. It's a sort of a fashionable thing. We've, we've heard that Bhutan has got a gro gross happiness pro yes, product, and, and Mexico apparently is now one of the happiest places in the world. Uh, so I haven't, seen, I haven't done any systematic things. This is just a completely non-professional uh, judgment. But uh, it's surprising that many of those societies where people are very, uh, report very high um, happiness uh, indices, they happen to be in you know, like places like West Africa or you know, uh, Venezuela. And yeah, but I think those like are exceptions. That. I mean, the, the surveys that I've seen, actually, African countries are the least happiest countries in the world, uh, this latest survey that I've seen. So maybe there's some exceptions to that, and maybe some of the happy, I mean, people cope very well. I mean, there, there are people who live in ghettos who are happy, relatively happy, because they're really focusing on their family and sort of things in life that they can control as opposed to what they can't control. So I, I think those may be some exceptions. Yeah, one of the reasons, let me just say this, the reason, one of the reasons that these panels are constituted like this is that I just don't see that any way of, of dealing with any of this, these issues by having one discipline. And, you know, from George to, through to the rest of them, it, it brings a group of people together. Terry, you have something to say? Well, there's been a spate of uh, articles about happiness and reports about uh, different countries having different levels of happiness. And one of the conclusions that, that I read, and maybe you can comment on it, is that the secret to happiness is having low expectations. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, one a topic that I'm really interested in right now is hedonic adaptation, which is the phenomenon that people tend to adapt to almost anything positive that happens to them. They don't adapt to all negative things, but they adapt to positive things. And, and there are two mechanisms. One is uh, social comparison, right, that you move into a great new neighborhood, but then everyone else is even richer than you are. And the other one is uh, aspirations, you know, which is related to expectations. Um, and yeah, well, your aspirations rise, right? So, so you get invited to conferences like this, this is great. And then, you know, and then you, f you expect that kind of level of stimulation and you're not happy if you get it. So I think there's certainly evidence to suggest that. So and there's also these national distinctions. Anthony, in a second, I mean, Sarah Lyle has a book out at the moment called The Anglo Files, which I commend to you, which is a, her take, having lived in London for a long time, of what Brits are like. And happiness, are we supposed to be professionally miserable? Well, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's an interesting um, point, this one, about talking about the happiness of a society, because I do think there's a fallacy of composition at work there. Um, uh, it, it may very, very well be that in a society in which a lot of individuals are living uh, robustly flourishing lives and they feel very confident and they can have their say in the public debate, that that society is going to look like one where there's a lot of quarreling and argument and busyness going on. Uh, and it may also be such that um, all these, uh, you know, surveys that we have about 
measures of happiness have remained constant over time, but individual wealth has increased, and so this is meant to be an argument against materialism. And all that. that really is about expectations. That really is about people's perceptions, about wanting um, all sorts of other things, other components of what's going to make for an individually flourishing life, which would make the conversation in that society look a very robust one, and by some external measure, therefore, not a happy society. One thing that's not very noticeable about these international comparisons about happy societies is that, yes, they tend to be societies with extremely low expectations or with a very, very high, uncritical uh, religious commitment. So this is related to the last question, but, uh, and it's for Sonia, but it relates to what uh, Owen and George also said. Are there any dangers to being happy? I ask this because happiness is sort of normally distributed as a trait, and uh, that suggests some evolutionary selection on both ends of the spectrum. Um, sure. So there's actually some recent work on uh, optimal levels of happiness, and Ed Diener and his colleagues have sh are showing now, very, again, very recently, that the people who are too happy, so you're basically a 10 on a 10-point scale as opposed to an 8, um, suffer a little bit. And, and this is not surprising, you know. So, you know, like when we're in newly in love, you know, we can't get our work done, you know, because we're just too happy. And, and people... Um, People who are too happy are, are not as productive. They don't actually make as much money. They, the tens don't make as much money as the eights. Um, uh, relationships actually don't s tend to suffer because uh, research that people talked about positive illusions, that positive illusions are actually really adaptive in relationships. You want to think your partner is better than he or she really is. Um, and then, of course, happiness. You know, I talked about all these benefits of happiness, but it can be used for evil as well, right? So, so you could be a really, like if you're a, member of the mafia and you're really happy, you could be really successful at what you do. So, um, so yeah, so there are, there are some dangers. When I, um, when I, ask, when I talk about um, eudaimonia, I'll sometimes ask students uh, about famous figures, I'll say, Con was Confucius happy? Was Buddha happy? And they'll almost always say it's they don't, it, it, the question is orthogonal to the way we understand these things. I, I think it's, I think uh, happiness studies, there's some good work in linguistics. This is a very, what people mean by that concept is, uh, is highly variable. I mean, I think this is a, a case where going back to something like the Aristotelian point, you'll hear the word, so there's a homonym out there that everybody knows how to use and point to, but it means radically different things in different contexts. And I don't think that a subjective feeling state is all upon reflection. This is back to my idea about expertise that we think the best lives are made of. I think that it's not, it's sometimes not the point. I don't even think happiness, standard brand American, is a necessary condition for flourishing. I think it's a typical and reliable condition of flourishing. It's better to have it than to not. But this is again where I think the sort of synthetic discussion among disciplines is really helpful. Yeah, Owen, I just wanted to, to uh, ask you a question about your comment that the students found it very um, dispiriting uh, to think of themselves as animals, and that totally caught me by surprise. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a couple of things. One is, why do you think that is? But also, in your studies of, of comparative, as it were, religions, yeah. I mean, are the people, are the Buddhists that you talk to surprised to find that they are one animal amongst others? I mean, is this a cross-cultural thing? Or, and, but, but, but mainly, I really want to know what's going on. OK, good. The, um, well. It surprised me too, Patty. So, um, because I, I think something like this might be the case. I, I'm not sure if I agree with like Paul Bloom, who thinks that we're all natural-born dualists. But so, but we might be because mind-body dualism does appear in other traditions. Although, again, not in the Chinese tradition, but you see it in the Indic traditions. It's very, it's very much there. I mean, it's and it's it's required by what Guvin said. Certain ideas of rebirth and reincarnation require a disembodied mind. So given the ubiquity of ideas of survival, there's a metaphysics, a, a kind of a folk psychological metaphysics that's required to understand that. In the West, of course, we have the idea of the great chain of being, the scala natura. And even if you go secular, I mean, even if you move away, there's still the hierarchy. So we're the, we're the top of the heap. And uh, so I've never been persuaded by the fact um, that people who are when people say that they're um, concerned about Darwinism, I often think, well, they're right to be concerned about Darwinism because it really is destabilizing. In other words, I don't take the side that says, oh, that you shouldn't get nervous about that. 
I mean, I just think it's truth, true, and it's, I mean, I'm the kind of person I read about in the New York Times last week, they said Francis Bacon said that his art was, he was an optimist about nothing. That's kind of the way I see the world. Um, I think there's re room to be optimistic and happy, even if you think that there, nothing happens after we're gone. It's just, but other people aren't persuaded of that. But I think these narratives that we've been telling about us not being animals really is still the popular view. And so I think that's where Darwin just gets people. Because if our, if, our, if our fate is the fate of other animals, then people know that other animals die, decay, and disperse, and then that's done. That's the thing. So could, I think that's what's going on. Could, could, could I just add I a am, comment? Uh, sorry, Roger. Sure, we'll we'll just, that, we'll that point, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. This, I mean, it's a, a surprising phenomenon that, I mean, and it seems to be an American thing, too, that a lot of people who are very opposed to creationism, intelligent design, and so on, are so because they don't want to see human beings included in the animal realm in that way. And what, what's interesting about this, of course, is that in the early Christian centuries, people thought when you die, your body sleeps, and then at the last trump, it's resurrected physically, and you live in a new, in a new kind of completely healthy body, a new dispensation. And the great chain of being idea, I mean, we've, we've got to remember that the, the human being stood at, not at the top, but at the center of the scale, because it connected animal nature with spiritual nature. I mean, in the great chain of being, there were the archangels and angels, principalities and powers, in a whole hierarchy of heavenly beings, all the way up to the deity. And what, what was striking about the Renaissance was that it removed human beings from that chain, a chain in which it had been p part nature, part spiritual. Um, you think about uh, Pico della Mirandola, the oration on the dignity of man. It takes human beings out of the, uh, that chain and makes a kind of exceptionalist case for it. So this idea, this idea which is you know, bearing fruit now in the great debate between ID and, and science, is uh, relatively speaking a, a rather recent idea. Naomi. My question is for George. I wanted to ask you about high functioning alcoholics and whether or not you think that's a myth or whether there's evidence whether those people somehow have a different brain chemistry that enables them to continue being addicted for long periods of time without spiraling downward? Well, I think it really depends on how you define a high functioning alcoholic. Um, how about a writer? Uh, you know, we're talking about the miserable ones that don't fit in with the creative. You know. Well, again, they may be functioning well at writing, but I'm not sure they're functioning well at their interpersonal relationships if they're beating up on their significant other, okay, or they've disenfranchised their whole family. So I think it really, there are seven criterion for that the American Psychiatric Association uses to define addiction. You're supposed to meet three of them. So you could reasonably find high drinking individuals who don't meet the criterion for addiction. And that would be what I would call what you're terming a, a high functioning alcoholic. But there are two things to be said about that. They don't stay that way, okay? They all, I mean, I don't care. You know, my colleague Barbara Mason has these unbelievable stories about the deans at the University of Miami who you know, end up checking in to have uh, some workup on their, uh, because of pancreatitis, and she sends a note over and says, you know, this dean's going in for a workup on pancreatitis, and, um, you know, you better watch out for the delirium tremens. And they write back and say, you cannot possibly, you know, impugn this dean to think that he might have an alcohol problem, and the guy rips out his Foley catheter 24 hours later in florid DTs, okay? So, you know, um, you, you know, alcoholism is a, is a disease that's pervasive and, and, and attacks all socioeconomic levels and all intellectual levels, and sometimes you don't know it until you're in a situation where you can't drink. So, you know, I, I would say that, but, but, you know, there are people who can drink a ton of alcohol and, and function fine. And, you know, if you want to talk about a drug that you can take a lot of and function fine, it's opiates. I mean, opiates are harmless drugs. They don't do any harm to your body. The only thing that's harmful with opiates is, in fact, you can't even die from opiate withdrawal. You can not die from alcohol withdrawal, but you don't die from opiate withdrawal. You're just totally miserable. But, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the worst state that you could possibly ever be in. So that's one of the problems with being an opiate addict. The other problem with being an opiate addict is getting the drug and, and, and uh, not getting hepatitis or AIDS from use of needles and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and respiratory depression because, uh, and possible death from overdose because the dealer that's dealing you the drugs maybe slipped you a, a higher concentration. Apart from that, it's fine. It's just fine. <laughs> um, Beatrice, go on. <clears throat> Hi. Sorry. As a physician, I'm a little... Um, 
uh, concerned about the possibility than the happiness studies, although you addressed partly the issue of endogeneity um, by looking at the issue of temporality, you didn't really address at all the possibility of common mechanism. And in medicine, there are a large number of known factors that influence both affect and all of the outcomes that you mentioned, health, um, creativity, success, viral resistance together. And among these would be, for example, insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction, occult infection, sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, pro-oxidant exposures, and in the positive direction, exercise, um, omega-3 fatty acid consumption. And so the issue for all but one of the studies, and that one could also be explained a different way, is that you can't really ascertain from these studies whether there's a common factor that's promoting both happiness and the favorable outcome or whether happiness um, itself promotes th that favorable outcome. I'm not inherently opposed to the possibility. I'm going to take a second to actually tie together something you said with something George Koop said um, on the issue of hedonism being a limited resource. And one possibility would be that energy reserves determine both the amount of happiness you can afford and also your success in the other domains. And each of the factors that I happen to mention as health factors are also factors that influence energy reserve. And I wonder if you wish to comment on that. Well, I'll just start by saying, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, these, these studies, we had these 225 studies we looked at, they by no means are they you know, definitively prove that happiness causes these things. And what we, what we tried to do is we just had the evidence that is available and we had correlational studies that, that are imperfect in many ways, but lots of domains, that's all you can do. Um, and then there were longitudinal studies that are a little bit better, but also have their pros and cons. And then experimental studies that also have their pros and cons. And we tried to triangulate, you know, and that's sort of the best answer we had. But absolutely, I agree with you that there might be other third variables, common factors that might be leading to both, um, both happiness and the outcomes in you know, different directions. So, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you on that. George? Yeah, I, I, I would just extend it to the fact that the, the physiological parts that, that limit pleasure are actually transmitters that we have in our brain that are used to make us feel good and to flourish, or whatever term you pr prefer to use. But they're also limited. And they, but they also, the other twist to that is that they're not only limited by their own function, but there's something else in the brain that, that controls them. And that's the maybe a little more insidious philosophical argument. There's, there is an anti-reward system, according to me. I'm not sure the rest of the world agrees with that, but there, there is a system that limits pleasure, I think, actively limits pleasure. And that's different from losing a resource. Walter, you have a uh, uh, yeah. Walter's I had a question for Anthony. Uh, it's stimulated by your talk, the others might have something to say about it, but it really has to do with the role of freedom and autonomy and empowerment. Because I like the way you accentuate the negative and uh, don't try to come up necessarily with a positive single vision of the good life. Great idea, but then you did say, but you know, there ought to be empowerment, there ought to be autonomy. Well, a lot of people don't like that. I mean, my brother-in-law moved from Zimbabwe uh, to the U.S., and he couldn't go in the grocery store. There are too many kinds of cereal. I don't know which one to pick. Uh, and, but I want to ask about a particular group. What about the Amish? I mean, they don't want choices. They want the community to make choices for them. They want the leaders to do it. They're happy that way, uh, in a sense. But then I'm not sure I want to call that the good life. So in assessing the value, the good life, uh, what's the role of autonomy and freedom and empowerment? Uh, it, it's a great question. I mean, it, it's um, you know, the, the spark for a, for a big debate about how one understands this. I just iterate very, very briefly my point that um, given that there is such a variety of possibilities for what would count uh, by any objective standard as a good and flourishing life for individuals, uh, incident upon the talents that those individuals have for making such a life, what one needs at the social or community level is to uh, institute structures that open up the space for that to happen. That's why you give a sort of negative account of what, of what a society shouldn't do to interfere with uh, choices and, and, and autonomy. Um, but the point you make is a very, very good one. I mean, a lot of people don't want autonomy. A lot of people find the agony of choice, the agony of freedom, this is something that the existentialists are very keen to pick up on. Uh, just too much, and they would like other people to make decisions for them. I mean, the point is really nicely put by Bertrand Russell, who said, most people would rather die than think than most people do, you know, because it I mean, really is a, a, a hard thing to have to uh, um, reflect on your life and, and, uh, and do the labor. Um, until you learn, I suppose, that it is the doing of the labor which is the goodness of the life. It's not 
you know, actually attaining the goal. And if you think about how you value your friends, you don't value them uh, entirely for what they've succeeded in doing, but for the fact that they want to succeed in doing those things and that they're really working towards them. So it's the old cliche about the, the journey mattering much more than the arrival and so on. That, that is just true of, of what good lives are like. That kind of life has to be an autonomous one. There's got to be a lot of individual choice in it. The individual himself or herself has to be responsible for picking and being able to defend the values that they want to see realized in their lives. But, but it's labor, so you're dead right. I mean, it's a psychological truth that uh, there are lots of people who just simply don't want to under undertake it. This connects in very nicely with something Owen was saying about you know, stage two existentialism there, uh, adverting to Sartre and, and Camus, that um, their starting point was there's no given set of values. You know, we find ourselves thrown into a, into a, a world which is intrinsically, in, in, just in a neutral sense, meaningless. It doesn't have any given meanings. So we've got to make them. We've, we've got to create them. And they talked about things like finding love and being creative and uh, uh, accepting one's freedom, which is a heavier responsibility, and acting upon it, uh, and recognizing the dignity of, of, um, of, of the human being, given the human condition. And, and those are, are values that can be imposed upon or created in an otherwise sort of ethically vacuous domain. Uh, and uh, again, you're right, it's just a lot of people just don't want to do that. They want an answer given to them. They want a neat, short, simple story with closure about what the meaning of life is, and then they know what to do to try and conform to it as much as possible anyway. Of course, in our modern times now, people cherry-pick the bits that, that are most uh, easy for them to do, but uh, certainly they want that. So you could have that. You could yield up. You could, you could submit. Islam means submission, the greatest pride, uh, the greatest sin in Christianity is pride, of thinking you could do it yourself and so on. So you submit your intellect and your choices to something else. You live according to that, and then things become easy. But um, I think it's, it's a little bit like um, the high-functioning alcoholic that you know, it doesn't sustain if you begin to think about it.